Now we're going to welcome the candidates, and I am going to um, announce that Linda Siegel um, is said that she will be running late. Uh, she is in position one, so we, we can see there that the empty seat is going to be Linda at some point this evening. In position two, we, two, we have uh, Pablo Cedillo. He is here this evening. And then uh, two candidates running for position four, and that's Jack Sullivan and Zuby Wilson. So we welcome you this evening. Uh, we have invited the candidates to bring their own campaign literature this evening, and you can find these materials on a table just outside the door. So uh, as we close this evening, I hope you'll uh, feel free to pick up any of those materials as you like on the way out. Uh, Judy Williams is going to be our moderator this evening, and Judy is our the league's uh, program chair as well as our past president. And I'm going to just welcome her to the podium, and then she is going to be uh, working with the candidates and moderating this evening. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. I'd like to thank President Grissom, who's here, uh, for allowing us to have the, the forum here. As you know, we always do, we try to do candidate forums for every election. And before we start, I want to go over the ground rules. Um, these are our, our league rules for running candidate forums. We do them all this way. And they're designed to maintain a fair and respectful atmosphere while providing you with the information about the candidates' positions on the issues that matter the most to you. <clears throat> the questions will be proposed by you, the audience, and selected by our screening panel to focus on the issues that generate the most interest. The screening panel will consolidate questions that are redundant and eliminate questions that are directed to one specific candidate or contain a personal attack. If you haven't already submitted questions, uh, please do so now. There are note cards, index cards, and pencils floating around, and if you can't find one, ask one of our question screeners. Um, that would be Karen Heldmeyer, Christopher Winetto, and Meredith Machen. Thank you. And also, we have volunteers who will pick them up. If you just wave one in the air, they'll come and get it. And you can also submit questions anytime during the forum. We will be giving the candidates a time limit of two minutes to make their opening statements. And, um, and we will give them one minute or two minutes to answer the questions, depending on what the screeners think is a good time for the questions, so they don't drag out, but they also are answered completely. Our timekeeper is Janet Lincoln. She's sitting right there. And you will, uh, when a candidate has 30 seconds left, she'll hold up the yellow card saying 30 seconds. When the candidate's time is up, she will hold up the red stop sign. At that point, the candidate will wind up immediately. If not, I'll interrupt. We don't have a buzzer or we can't turn off the mic, so <laughs> please honor the two minute li or the whatever the limit is. And finally, we'll end the forum with two, two minute closing statements by the candidates in reverse order of their opening statements. I may have to adjust this a little bit since Linda Siegel is not here yet. Uh, she did say she would be here shortly, we hope. A uh, couple of other things. Please silence your cell phones, and if you need to make or take a call, please do so outside in the hallway. We want to use our limited time to hear the candidates on as many topics as possible, so if you feel like a clapping, applauding, yelling, please don't yell. Uh, but please hold it until the end of the forum and acknowledge all, the, all of the candidates together at the same time. We don't like to take up a, a valuable time with applause in the middle of the, um, the forum. It's not a question, it's an announcement. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's an announcement, I can't read it. Would I announce that Oh, yes, there are sample ballots for each district on the table out in the hallway. Thank you, Nikki. Nikki Harnish is our, our voter services uh, person at the moment uh, for this forum, so she wanted to make sure you know that you can look at sample ballots and, of course, you can vote in this building. So we'll begin the two-minute two opening statements, and we'll hear first from the position two candidate, Pablo Cedillo. Next, we'll hear from position four candidate Jack Sullivan and Zuby Wilson, and hopefully Linda will be here in time to wrap up the, the initial uh, in, introductory statements. 
We will also have two-minute closing statements, and we'll go in the reverse order of the candidates when we started. So basically, last goes first. So I'd like to start with opening statements, Mr. Cedillo. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thanks to the League and the Association of uh, University Women for sponsoring this forum. I think forums are very important to inform the uh, constituents of uh, the candidates' positions and, and uh, their vision and what they see, what is important for the community college and actually the district at large. Uh, I'd like to start off by introducing my wife, Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy, please stand. Dorothy and I met at, uh, we were both students at New Mexico Highlands University. I'm uh, a nat native northern New Mexican. I was telling someone that my family came to Santa Fe in 1647 and they liked it so much they decided to stay. So uh, it's, uh, it is a, quite an amazing community, but uh, certainly the college uh, celebrating its 30th anniversary is even greater. It's a great institution. Uh, it's serving, well, let me start by saying that I am presently uh, a member of the governing board of the, of the college. I was um, appointed in, on March 27, 26th of last year. Uh, there was a vacancy, and there were, <clears throat> I think, about 20 or 25 people that applied for the position, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be selected to fill the position. So now I'm running as a um, to maintain my my seat on the uh, uh, on the on the governing board. So uh, there'll be more to come. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Jack Sullivan, and uh, I'm a candidate for the uh, community college board. Um, I'd like to introduce you. Also to my wife, Vicki, who's sitting in the corner there after the uh, forum. Feel free to come up and visit with either of us. Uh, why am I interested in serving on the board and what experience and expertise and qualifications can I bring to the board? I've been a resident of Santa Fe for 40 years. I'm currently a community college student and I'm committed to seeing our youth receive the best education possible to prepare them for careers that match their interests and abilities, and our adults to having access to the college's extraordinary facilities to improve their workforce skills and lifelong learning. I'm a practicing professional engineer. Engineers are problem solvers. Um, I bring forward an opportunity to bring some technical perspective to the board in its deliberations, and also to assist them in developing some additional focus on a STEM curricula, which is the backbone of our jobs in the future will be. <coughs> I have a lifelong commitment to community and public service. I'm a decorated Army veteran. I served two terms as a Santa Fe County Commissioner. I've been a student mentor and also actively involved with youth soccer and Little League. I've been an advocate for transparency in governing bodies for some time and I accomplished the first communication, uh, the first transparency uh, at the Santa Fe County Commission by means of televising the commission meetings, which started the first year uh, that I began my service, which was in 2001. I have a Master of Science in Civil Engineering from Stanford University and a Bachelor of Civil Engineering from Georgia Tech. Pleasure to be here. Mr. Wilson. My name is Eric Zuby Wilson on the ballot as Zuby Wilson. Uh, I have been had a relationship with this college for over 20 years now. Uh, started taking classes in 1994, and uh, I'm an example of what Dr. Gonzalez says as a student who is badly in need of ad advising because 20 years later I have not graduated, and so I'm bringing down the college's numbers. Um, but I think we have to be very careful. Uh, I, I'm I'm running. In this race, I've been a staff person and instructor at this college for the last four years, and I've been the chair of the staff senate the last two years. Uh, it's been suggested that somehow that represents a conflict of interest. And I want to be very clear, I stepped down from my position 
as the chair of the staff senate in order to run for this position. And the reason that I'm running is not to be an advocate for the staff or the faculty or the students, but because of my experience and my time here and all the committees and boards that I've served on, I've developed expertise and I have a very broad understanding of what is going on at the college, what the college needs, what some of the mistakes we've made, the struggles that the staff, the faculty, and the students and administrators at this college are going through, some of the unmet needs of our community that we could reach out and expand and do a better job of. This is why I'm running, because I have the credentials, and I think without a doubt, in terms of credentials, I am the best candidate running at this time for the position. I understand that I am not a representative of the staff or the faculty, and I really truly hope that all of the board recognizes, and I don't think they always have in the past, recognized what a critical constituency to proper operation of this institution, the staff, the faculty, the administrators, and the students are. And I have an appreci appreciation for that. I would not be representing them, but I think that I do have the experience and the capacity to do a good job in this position. Thank you. I want to mention also we have one other current board member present, Martha Romero, in the back row. And now we'll move on to the questions. The first question will be answered by Mr. Cedillo. And the question is, what is the most important change that needs to be made at Santa Fe Community College? Two minutes, sorry. I think the most important thing is to continue to offer uh, courses that are going to prepare our students for the workforce in, in our district. Uh, I think it's important that we provide the necessary uh, uh, assistance to students that have not had the level uh, of competency in their particular in the particular field. Uh, I think that uh, the other important thing is the retention. Retention of students is of extreme importance, and I and I value that. Uh, we get uh, month uh, reports every board meeting on on retention, and I think the that we are doing well, doing uh, as well or better than other community colleges in the state of New Mexico. I think that uh, uh, the uh, financial situation is of utmost importance. And the board is, is charged with a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that we're going to have uh, a balanced budget and, and not, uh, and first of all, not to sacrifice instruction. That's of utmost importance. And I think that uh, with the President Grisham and the, his executive team uh, are, are providing us with good information for the governing board to, to make those decisions that are important not only for students but for our community. So I would say in summary that students are first of all the most important thing. The other thing that I think is important is communication uh, shared governance with, with the faculty and students. I think that's very important, and we're doing that. Next, Mr. Wilson. Well, I think clearly something we have to look at and we have to work <clears throat> very hard at, and I think the board and the president made progress, is on financial stability and long-term financial planning. And in that vein, part of that is better financial reporting, making sure that we have the best possible data. I think that's something that for a variety of reasons may have broken down in the past. And so I think without any ill intent that some poor assumptions were made in the past and some poor decisions were made as a result of poor assumptions. So I think making sure, and I think that the, the, to the board's role is partly going to have to be making absolutely sure, never taking anyone's word that the data we're getting is the best making sure that we look at that. And that, it's one of the things I think was very clear to most of the faculty and staff on the campus last year when we were making bold moves, making big restructurings, hiring lots of new faculty. I don't think there was any illusion in the, in the mind of any of the faculty or staff that we were spending much more money under the new program than we were, had been before. And the question is, 
where we, I know the, the former president thought that spending down reserves, we had too much in reserves. But I think again, that was, mis, that was poor assumptions. Um, <clears throat> we need to continue engaging our community and looking towards the future and planning well. I think something we've done very well as a college is staying ahead of the curve, seeing, not looking to how we can serve today or yesterday's workforce, but planning for tomorrow's and making sure that we're in tune with the direction our community is going. We've done very good with that. We need to continue. Um, we need better utilization of our on-campus use resources, especially the human resources. So putting the best instructor in the classroom, not, a, not more full-time instructor, but always the best instructor in the classroom. And when we have great instructors who have expertise in areas that may help us plan and develop infrastructure, we need to involve them and take advantage of that. Thank you. Next question is also two minutes. What? Mr. Sullivan. See, this is the problem. Linda Siegel is missing and she ruined my grid. So I'm having to wing it. So I'm very sorry. So if I do it again, please yell at me. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, two things are um, important and a third I feel is, is extremely important. Um, first, strong fiscal oversight has been an issue uh, with the college in the last uh, 18 months to two years. Um, I served eight years on the Santa Fe County Commission. I went through eight annual budgets. Um, there, it's a grueling process, but nonetheless, it's what makes uh, the uh, governance and what makes the college and what makes the county tick. Uh, the second thing is one mentioned uh, by um, board member Cedillo, and that is communication. Uh, I am, as I mentioned, a, a student, as is my wife, uh, at the college, and informally what I hear and have heard uh, most frequently from staff and from instructors and the teachers is, and the faculty, is that uh, we're not being listened to. So that's obviously a communication breakdown and we need to work on that. There are procedures in place, um, so I think we can work within those procedures to strengthen them. But finally, uh, I think the, uh, the student uh, situation of recruiting and uh, identifying and attracting students to the benefits that we have here at the community college is where we need to spend the majority of our time. We need to have increased emphasis on the dual credit program where we uh, work with 11th and 12th graders to come in and take colleges, but we also need to have increased emphasis on 7th and 8th graders so that we can prepare them, those that are interested and those that have the uh, capabilities for a STEM criteria. Uh, and that's one of the areas that I would like to see the college improve, and we'll talk a little bit later about uh, the STEM curriculum. Thank you. Next question, um, and we'll start with Mr. Sullivan. What do you believe the role of the Community College Board is? Three minutes. Two minutes. The, the role of the board is, is, uh, is clearly laid out in statutes. Um, and, and that's quite simply that um, it's the duty of the college board to determine financial and educational policies of the community college, shall provide for the management of the college and execution of those policies by selecting a competent president, and upon his recommendation shall employ other administrative personnel, and the board shall fix tuition, fee rates, uh, and accept gifts, financial aid, hold, sell, buy, rent property, in summary, this is where the buck stops. The board has that uh, final responsibility uh, and accountability uh, for the operation and the financing and the finances of the community college. Now, in doing that, um, it needs to set a careful balance between uh, micromanaging, uh, which is not good, and not managing at all which is equally uh, bad by um, maintaining an ivory tower uh, approach uh, to 
to the uh, to the process. Uh, I've always felt that the that the the worst question uh, is the one that's not asked. And uh, I think the board members have uh, the responsibility to do their homework. <coughs> uh, and having done that, uh, to interact with each other in, at the meetings and at the work sessions, and having done that, um, to ask detailed questions so that they are extremely comfortable with the direction that uh, the board is taking on any particular issue. Mr. Wilson. Having since Jack cited the statute, uh, I think that's clearly statutorily the role of the board. Um, but I think the board has a much broader role than that, and there's more a great deal of importance. One of the things is that we are elected officials. So a very critical role is making sure that the community's needs, the community's interests are served by the college and the board is the conduit they are the they are the ones who for whom the community is the constituent and who are there to make sure that we are responsive to this community i also believe and i would like to see all the board members take a greater role in helping morale of the entire campus community helping everybody feel as though the board is there to help support and listen. So when Jack, when you talk about communication, I think in making sure that all the board members really are very present and that everyone in the campus community says, that's my board member, not just one, but all of them are people that they can talk to when they have a concern, when they see something going wrong. It's an, and I don't think if I have a problem with my boss, I don't like what they're not. That's obviously not the appropriate role, but when you talk about the sense that people get that no one's listening, well, the board should be listening, if no one else. And I don't think it should always go through just the shared governance process. I think as elected officials, we have to recognize that everyone who is part of this campus community is a, a constituent. As a matter of fact, the people who work and go to school on this campus represent almost, it varies from year to year, a quarter of the total population that we represent as board members. So I think that's very important. I think we have our statutory roles, but I think we also have to recognize in terms of the morale, what people think about this college, what the college thinks about itself, and how the campus community feels about this institution is one of our roles as well. Mr. Cedillo. Mr. Sullivan actually quoted the, um, the College Act correctly. Uh, but in summary, it, it really is the fiduciary responsibility of the board to make sure that we're overseeing the budget. Uh, we want to make sure that it's going to be properly balanced. Our role as a governing board is to hire uh, or appoint a competent president. And I'm very pleased to say personally that this board has appointed a competent president that interacts very good with uh, his executive team. So there is, there is that kind of communication and there is, um, certainly we can improve, there's no question about that we can improve our communication with, with the rest of the staff, but I know uh, each member of the executive team and I'm confident that those members of the executive team are doing their best to ensure that that they have a feel for what what's going on in the college and and reporting to uh, to the president and the president I think has uh, uh, a responsibility as well to go beyond his uh, constitution or his, his responsibilities as a president and uh, because we are uh, uh, a small entity, less than 7,000 7, students, uh, I know that the president is doing everything he can. And trust me that the governing board does ask tough questions of the president because after all, we are elected officials and we are responsible to our constituents. Thank you. Next question. 
<clears throat> and we'll start with Mr. Wilson. What can the board do and what can the college do to coordinate and work together with the Santa Fe Public Schools to meet the needs of students and com community employers and the requirements of higher education? It's a two minute question. And that starts with Mr. Wilson. So I've been interacting for a number of years now with advisory boards for programs in trades and advanced technologies. I have been working in the community in a variety of fields, culinary, uh, sustainable technologies, and in education for many, many years. I, I do have a relationship and I've been working with the public schools, sometimes more than the college would like me to, at, um, to try to figure out what are the best pathways. One of the things I think is very difficult is we've moved to an era where we're pushing more and more of a dual credit methodology. And I think dual credit is good, and for our students who are doing well, it's outstanding. But I think the, the school district has to look towards, it's more important that a student makes it to this level with competent skills in math and English and communication than it is that they got some extra class in college. So I would rather see students come into our school prepared for the rigor of a college program because too often we are having difficulty, either we're putting people into all remedial classes or we're putting people into more advanced classes that they're not prepared for. So I think we have to look at both and that's something we have to work closely. I have a good relationship and I've worked with most of the members of the current school board for many years, even before I came out to this college. And I think we have to look at how we interact with them, what are they doing, what is the preparation that they're setting up for us, what are their expectations, and how is that setting up our students for the next level? Whether that being going into a career in the industry, whether that be going on to a four-year college, or that be going on to a master's program. I think it's great that we started the HEC so we can facilitate that, but we have to look at those pathways and I think we have to work very closely with the school board. Not only that, but also coordinating vacation schedules so my students don't have to drop out for a week to take care of their kids during spring break. Thank you. Mr. Cedillo, I'll ask you not for next. Well, I think that's of utmost importance that we work with the Santa Fe Public Schools. And, and we're not only having conversations with them or casual meetings. We actually have agreements with the Santa Fe community, with the Santa Fe uh, Public Schools on preparing after all, the Santa Fe uh, public school system feeds to this college. And we're just as interested as anyone to ensure that the students that are coming to this community college are prepared to, uh, to enter into some, uh, into the subject matter uh, with, in reading and math and, and some of the sciences that, that I think are of utmost importance. So it's not a casual agreement. It is a formal agreement, and, and we're going to formalize those agreements even more because uh, uh, it is important that uh, we prepare our students well, and uh, that can only be done with uh, communication between those two entities. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Thank you. Um, how to best work with the Santa Fe Public Schools is the issue. Um, I would recommend to you an, an article in today's Albuquerque Journal, if you have the opportunity, written by the president of um, Central New Mexico Community College, um, where she uh, outlines where we are in New Mexico in education uh, of our youth, other than being 48th, which we are. Um, in that, she outlines that um, the jobs that are available now, 65% um, of them require, at a minimum, at least a certificate or an associate degree. Uh, where are we? Less than half of that, less than half. When students come into uh, and enroll in the Santa Fe Community College, 85% of them require remedial math. We don't call it that anymore. We call it developmental math. 60% of them require developmental English. That does a number of things. It puts a strain on the community college's resources. 
obviously, but it also serves to demotivate the student who has a goal in mind, hopefully, and would like to achieve something. So we need to work much more carefully. We need to counsel at the high school level. We need to motivate at the high school level. And we need to follow up at the high school level to get those students aware of what is out here, but also what is needed on their part to succeed at the Santa Fe Community College. Thank you. Next question is also two minutes. Several board candidates have suggested that paying for the operations of the Higher Education Center will be a challenge. What should the Santa Fe Community College Board do to meet that challenge? And we'll go to Mr. Sullivan again. Two minutes. Thank you again. Uh, one of the goals that the board has um, given to uh, President Grissom is to make the uh, Higher Education Center sustainable in five years and uh, uh, I assume that that he participated in that and so that that's a doable goal uh, as I understand it the uh, operational costs are around hundred and forty thousand dollars a year uh, those costs are paid by the participants uh, the major one at this point in time which is Highlands University uh, which occupies the majority of the uh, uh, second floor of the facility, in, which is fabulous. The uh, Small Business Development Center is there, uh, UNM is there, uh, IAIA is there in a smaller presence. Um, UNM was happy to get out of the cellar of the building and move over to the, to the new center. It's light, it's bright, it's a wonderful uh, learning environment. Um, we need to keep those uh, partners uh, activated and keep them um, interested in providing that, th that four-year curriculum and that bridge over to the center. If we can do that and we can keep students uh, in that pathway, then uh, I think the center will uh, ultimately become self-sustaining. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> well, it's interesting. Randy's a very clever guy, so I hope the board recognized when he agreed to make it fiscally sound in five years that he's only has a three-year contract. So, <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's a we, we, it's fiscally sound right now, and I think uh, as we move forward, I don't think it will be challenging to have real estate in that sector of the of the community. I think will not be difficult for us to find ways to utilize that space and in, in, including. Uh, substantial use in terms of conference facilities. Ideally, we have to be careful. I mean, I've heard a lot of talk about oh, we're going to do a credit there, we're going to do all these other things there. We can't lose sight of the mission of the Higher Education Center and start filling it up with all these other ways to make rent, and then suddenly there's not enough room for the mission of the Higher Education Center, which is to provide this, the third and fourth and fifth and sixth years of college to our students here in, so they don't have to commute. So I think we can do that. I think it's very doable. I think the, the, ava the availability of that, it's much difficult, more difficult to get people to want to come all the way out here. So renting space down there won't be difficult. And I think there's a lot of colleges not only in New Mexico, but around the, the state. The, the biggest that, that would be interested in partnering with us, and as we prove ourselves a better and better partner, I think we'll find that we have no problem. We have a very good group of students coming out of here, and we have a good faculty to collaborate with to expand those programs. Um, I, I also think that there are just tremendous opportunities in moving off campus and collaborating directly with the high schools. And having that campus where, I don't know if people realize, but a student taking a dual credit course out here, taking the bus, may spend up to two and a half hours on the bus just to get here. So coordinating and using that space is going to be something I will think will not be difficult. It will be easy to raise the money down the road. Mr. Cedillo. Well, the uh, Higher Education Learning Center certainly was uh, um, a long time in coming. Um, it's been going on for a number of years, uh, but 
Dr. Ortigo and others had a vision of having a, a learning center where we could serve students in our area. They didn't have to go to Albuquerque or to Las Cruces to get their, their bachelor's degree. And I must, I'm very optimistic that the, that the governing board uh, uh, is going to fulfill that, that uh, dream of, uh, of having that h higher education center. $140,000, I think, is doable. We have 250 students from New Mexico Highlands University uh, today. We have students from uh, UNM and uh, New Mexico State University. IAIA has is, is got a smaller piece, but they are um, certainly uh, going to have more students. I was very encouraged by the presidents of those colleges and representatives of uh, what, they, what they plan to, to do to make sure that it works. So I, I'm optimistic, and uh, with uh, our fidelity to our fiscal responsibility to HEC, uh, HEC uh, we're going to we're going to make it the kind of a first class higher education learning center in the state. Thank you. Now, for a bit of variety, I'll have a one minute question. Do you have any conflicts of interest that may affect your work on the board? How do you intend to deal with them, Mr. Cedillo? First, please. I do not have any conflict of interest uh, whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. I do not have any conflicts either. I'm not on the board, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, the same situation would occur uh, as occurred when I was uh, a, a member of the Santa Fe County Commission for eight years. Um, and uh, I have a practicing engineering firm we were unable to bid on um, county contracts or deal with uh, the county in, in a contractual basis, and that would be the same thing in the community college. I do want to add one thing. I'll put the B on Dr. On Dr. Grisham. Uh, and uh, the sustainability for the HEC is uh, to be done in four years, not five. So uh, we'll, we'll compress them a little. According to the goals set for 2014 and 15, uh, I called it five years. Excuse me for that. <laughs> Mr. Wilson. Well, well, I think whenever you serve in public office, you have to be careful of any potential conflict of interest, perceived or real. And you have to be very careful about how you approach that. I think everyone on the board has personal relationship, business relationships, historical relationships, family relationships. In a town as small as Santa Fe, there are always going to be times when there's some issue you're looking at that you have to say, can I really reasonably do that? Obviously, being a staff and a faculty member, I have, there are going to be times when, you know, if my the coordinator for renewable energy position would be to, going to be eliminated, that's my job. I probably shouldn't vote on that one. But as a staff person, is every time something has anything to do with any, any staff person comes up a conflict? No. Um, no, no more than when Jack was on the, the county commission that because he was an engineer, whenever there was an engineering project or a roadway, he would have to recuse himself on that. Thank you. Next question is two minutes. Are adjunct faculty adequately compensated at SFCC in, in either wages or benefits? And we will start with Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> One of the most disturbing things I saw happen at the school uh, since I've been here is as a result of the Affordable Care Act, we began to adjust some of our personnel policies and how we hire and when and how uh, adjunct faculty can be hired so we can make sure that we are not obligated to give them health insurance. I know that, for instance, at CNM, there is better compensation than we currently give at uh, Santa Fe Community College for adjunct uh, faculty. Having said that, I want to be clear that adjunct faculty is not a full-time position that you should expect to be able to raise a family on. That it is a part-time position. I would like to see us always hire the best faculty, and when that's an adjunct, that's great. 
But if people want to support themselves on a faculty position, they need to hire, look for a full-time faculty position or a staff position. Should we offer more money? Yes, but at what costs? I've spoken with in the AAUP and with many of the adjuncts. Would you like a raise if that meant that we had to reduce the number of classes because we couldn't afford as many adjunct instructors? What would be the cost? What are the choices? And we think we have to be very careful. Do I think we should pay them more? Absolutely. Do I think we should give them health insurance? Yes, and I think we are I'm on the faculty workload task force. And we are looking at statuses that could offer people who are regular fa adjunct faculty for year after year some way of getting health insurance, some way of possibly having more stability in their employment as an adjunct. But we have to be very careful. The adjuncts represent a lot of the teaching going on at this college. And I would not want to give them a raise if it meant offering less to our students. So I think we should always be looking for ways to be able to increase that compensation. We should be looking for ways that we can create and offer health benefits and other benefits for the adjuncts, but we should be careful how far we go with that without good planning and, and, and good uh, thorough investigation. Mr. Cedillo. I value adjunct uh, professors. I think they're uh, very important to this college as more adjunct professors than there are uh, full-time professors. Should we be paying them more? Of course. I think uh, that is that's important. I don't think that uh, at the present time uh, we we are paying them what they should get paid. But the board is looking at that, and uh, and so is uh, so is the president. Um, however, I, I think that uh, uh, we need to ensure that we are hiring the the best qualified adjunct professors in, at this college, and provide the right kind of uh, curriculum programs that we need to prepare our youngsters, our students for that. We have a very diverse a student population and uh, diverse in many, many, many aspects, uh, ethnically, uh, culturally, uh, gender, and, and we have to find a way to make sure that we're going to be serving that uh, diverse student body. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. I'm quite willing to take a look at a fair compensation plan for adjuncts. Um, as I understand the plan now, there is a set rate for uh, adjunct um, per semester. Uh, there's, I believe, some 300 adjunct professors at the community college, and around 75 full-time. So they are a critical element in the educational process. They also provide the college with flexibility to make up smaller classes uh, that an adjunct can handle um, and uh, at, at a lower cost than would uh, be the case with a full-time faculty member. So we have um, a situation where they provide a you know, a vital and a valuable resource to the college. In so far as insurance is concerned, um, we certainly can look uh, at group insurance, and if, um, if the uh, adjunct uh, professor is uh, interested in that and willing to pay for that group insurance, the college should be able to achieve a lower rate than an individual insurance or perhaps even lower lower than, um, than, than Obamacare. I don't know, but, but we can use that uh, as a potential uh, enticement to, to help those adjuncts who need the health insurance. Not all do, because some are doing it, um, certainly not as a full-time job, but as a labor of love and a labor of love in the education field. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question is also two minutes. Why does it appear to some that Santa Fe Community College favors putting infrastructure over faculty and students? How would you sort this out? 
uh, Mr. Sullivan? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, I hadn't heard that, uh, that people thought that, but um, all of our New Mexico education system is, is, is subject to uh, the, um, the statutory limitations of, of, of bond issues and mill levies, which, which can only go to, to limited, limited uh, purposes. And those limited purposes are primarily um, bricks and mortar and, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the services that, that go with those, those bricks and mortar. Um, and this is, there's a reason for this. They, they don't want um, more affluent uh, school districts to, um, to, to, uh, to, to have uh, tax levies that create imbalances between the more affluent and the less affluent districts. Um, the, the, the flip side, of course, of that, of that policy, that statewide policy, is that um, we, we do build a lot of buildings, um, but we, um, we, we still have the lowest teacher uh, salary levels um, in the United States, starting off at $30,000. So um, we, we try to compensate th that through the equalization formula at the state level. Uh, and we try to provide those operational funds. When I say we, I mean the legislature, uh, that are sufficient to, um, to, to uh, get competent uh, faculty in. But in, in, in all honesty, we are, we are um, just woefully behind. Mr. Cedillo. I think there's certainly, uh, that's a wrong perception, in my opinion, of the public, uh, that we value more uh, uh, infrastructure than we do the pay of, of, uh, of our professors. Uh, you have to realize that this building, these buildings, uh, they're 30 years old. We need uh, to complete a, a new roof in, at, at this college, and that's very costly. We have some other needs. Uh, so we need to have a facility that's going to be adequate to pro to provide the kind of instruction uh, uh, to provide instruction for our students. So uh, it, it's it's a real hassle now. I'm I'm a registered lobbyist at the at, at, at the legislature. We're we're trying to deal with this question of uh, uh, capital outlays, and uh, there's just no money at, at the state legislature. But I think that the board, as well as the administration of the community college, is trying to create that balance uh, of develop, making sure that we maintain. It's not only building, but maintaining our buildings. Yes, we do are anticipating, hopefully, to, to have a greenhouse. But that greenhouse will, there are students waiting to take courses at that greenhouse. So that's, that's an important thing for us. So uh, does it mean that we're totally disregarding uh, the pay of our professors, but there's other needs that we need to, to uh, look at to make sure that we're gonna provide the kind of instructions that we need for our students. Mr. Wilson. Well, it's, it's true to some degree that it is easier to raise money for capital expenditures and there's bonding and there's all sorts of funding sources that cannot. I know when we were buying some new furniture and putting in some new floors here, um, a lot of the faculty and staff were very upset because why I haven't gotten a raise in three years, how can we afford to put a new floor in? Well, one of the magics, one of the things we always have to look at is how do you manipulate capital expenditures into operating expenditure money? So for instance, when we put down a new floor in some of the wings of this college, the operating expenses for those floors was lower than it was for the carpeting. Does it also smells better, but we have to look at those kind of creative opportunities. Investing bond money in renewable energy projects like the solar array, another fantastic example of how you take capital expenditure money that you couldn't use for hiring faculty 
but then you'd reduce the operating expenditures in ways that you can take that savings and invest it in salaries and benefits and packages for our employees. So that's one thing, that's the magic. And I think as we look to bonds, every bond issue we should be looking at, where is the opportunity to reduce our operating expenditures with that expenditure of capital um, monies? Another thing Dr. Peters will, will tell you, we need to have full classrooms. It's very hard to give raises to people if we're running at bare minimum class sizes. When I have a more students per faculty member, and that sounds terrible in an education, but there's levels at which we can fill the classrooms and that will make free up more money for us to spend on salaries. We cannot have minimum class sizes and turn around and expect to have raises. We also have to look at creative funding, things like the Training Center Corporation, different ways that we can use our facilities to raise money, and I think the opportunities are there. We have to look for them, and I'm a good problem solver and find those kind of prob uh, opportunities. Next question is also two minutes. What do you think has to be done in order for Santa Fe Community College to become financially stable? Let's start with Mr. Cedillo. Well, we've already started the process with the financial stability uh, plan that uh, was presented to the board and the, and the board approved. Uh, I think we are on, on solid ground. We are on target, I think, with our restoring our credibility with the, with the, with the financial, uh, our financials. We're getting better information. Um, one of the things that the board did was to appoint two board members to uh, to be part of the budgeting process and to oversee the the budget, that's been a great help because we're getting accurate information because two board members are part of that uh, process. So I think that uh, we hopefully will by by July we'll be able to restore some of the the uh, salary cuts that we made uh, to get us on, on track. Five million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, to to uh, certainly overcome, but I think we're doing well. I, I'm I'm very optimistic about that. Mr. Wilson. Well, I would agree. I think we're uh, you know it's very quick to go into debt and very it's a long much longer more difficult road to come back out. And so I think that the president has put us on a good fiscal stability plan to help pull us out. It will be a long-term project, and it's something that we have to stay the course on. Um, but I think we also have to look towards going back out to bond again in the near future, because I think there's been a little bit of a little bit of fear of the college that, oh, we've gotten a lot of bad publicity, especially this fiscal mismanagement appearance. We can't go out to bond again. I think we need to go out to bond again. It's part of the long-term fiscal planning that we had had before the crisis was going to bond on a regular basis to bring in the revenues because in the state funding formula, the full operations of the, of the college and all the facilities is just not covered. And so bonding is part of that process. We also have to be careful to make sure that as we go to bond, and we have for many years, as we go out for a bond that we are going for a bond that will not raise taxes. As long as we keep on a regular cycle, we can make sure that every time we go to bond, it'll actually reduce taxes. If we wait and put this off for years and years, we will come to the point where when we go out for a bond, it will be to raise taxes. And I think it'll be a more difficult process at that point. So again, um, looking at creative opportunities, we have 350 acres here. There are a lot of opportunities with that land. We have opportunities for contract training. We've been do doing safety trainings for, for the Home Depot. There are lots of opportunities. And I think if we look at the skill set of all the people, all the faculty, all the administrative staff on this campus, and what do they have that they can put on the table that we can help to bring in funds to this college, I think we'll find it's substantial. But we have to look for it, and we have to ask for that. And I think the opportunities are there. Mr. Sullivan. I think the college has taken a good step in looking at uh, one of the two sides of the, of the fiscal crisis, um, and, and that's uh, the control of expenses. 
Um, the $5 million uh, deficit that uh, uh, President Grissom uh, presented to the board and uh, resulted in the financial stability plan, which the board approved, uh, is uh, a little bit of uh, uh, effort on everyone's part to, to make up that, that deficit. Uh, a little over a million of it uh, will come from uh, teacher uh, instruction salaries and staff salaries and, um, and the rest from other sources. Uh, so, um, so I think we're on the right track there. Um, where we need to start our planning effort is on enhancing revenue. Uh, and enhancing revenue means getting students into the programs interacting with the community uh, for example the new welding facility in the technology center uh, getting um, someone from caterpillar to come over and and uh, some some instructors that are needed to get that facility uh, up to speed and and, uh, and fully uh, operational uh, there are a lot of community uh, approaches that we can take including the public schools which we talked I talked about earlier that we can market what benefits the college has for the community and we will find that there are resources out there in the community that will help us uh, begin to increase our student body uh, and that's where our revenues will ultimately uh, derive from thank you two minute question what would you do to improve transparency uh, mr. Wilson no me transparency accountability okay, did, did he, just said me. me or you yeah. oh, who, I couldn't hear you said sorry so, um, I, I don't think there is entirely a lack of transparency. I mean, the board meetings are open meetings. There are opportunities for people to come and listen and watch. Even parts of the board meetings are even uh, put on, on television. I think that obviously in the operations of a college, there are some things that should not be public when we get into personnel issues and things of that nature. I think that the college has done a pretty good job of reaching out and involving the community and finding people who are interested in finding, I mean, one of the reasons I ran this time was I was very concerned that there would be no contested races in this board election. I'd like to see a time when there are three or four, as there were last time, people running for every position. And I think that we can get back there. But part of that is engaging the community, not just being transparent, but being involved and engaged with community partners so that they're not just able to see what we're doing, they're involved, they're engaged, they're supportive. They see what we're doing and they're helping to, to tell us what we need to do. That can get out of control, but I think we need to have our integrity, but we need to be very interactive. When I've gone to the Workforce Development Institute of the American Association of Community Colleges, that was a clear advantage that this college has and one of the th reasons that we're respected around the country. We're not one of these co colleges that waits and then tries to create programs to fulfill the jobs that the community is now do clamoring for. We've been very good at being ahead of the curve, being engaged with our community about what kind of an economy does Santa Fe want in the future? What are the jobs that will be coming up in the industries that exist here today? And how do we prepare those programs so that the day those jobs are in demand, we have our first graduating class ready to come in and fill those jobs. So I think it's not just about transparency, it's really about engagement. Mr. Sullivan. Um, one of the things that the college needs to do um, with regard to transparency is to um, publish the, the budget online so everyone can, uh, can relate to it. Uh, and publish it in a uh, format that's uh, understandable to the majority of people. Uh, what that will do, among other things, is um, it will allow uh, the faculty and the staff and the students 
to see where the money is going and where the money is being budgeted uh, and give them the opportunity to comment on that if they like, give them the opportunity to understand um, that the college has numerous obligations that it has to fulfill uh, and it's all outlined there in that budget. Uh, many, in fact, most community colleges do that and I think it's a simple step because as you uh, by doing that, engage the faculty and the staff and the students. Um, there is a ripple down effect that they uh, themselves create as they engage their family and their friends as to what is happening at the college. So, so we have a, a governance that's not based on rumor, but it's based on facts and figures that insofar as the um, budget is concerned. So I think that's a, a really big item and, and it's a relatively simple one, uh, followed up uh, by um, a number of uh, procedures that I think uh, can, uh, can benefit. And we talked about engaging the, the high school students as well as the high school teachers. Once, once that uh, group of, of uh, support people see what's available, you, you've begun that marketing process, which is part of the transparency process as well. Thank you. One minute question. How would you engage alumni, businesses? I did it again, Mr. Cedillo, <laughs> sorry. Last but not least. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that we pride ourselves of being transparent at this community college. Uh, we have, we're, our meetings are all are public as, as we indicated, but we're also on television. What saddens me is that the lack of interest of people coming to our board meetings. And uh, I don't know why that is, uh, but I think it's important that transparency is really credible, is, is our credibility. If we start to say, oh, we forgot to publish our, our board meetings, well, that's, uh, that is not acceptable. And we're very careful about to ensure that we publicize, publicize our, our board meetings on time. And uh, so I, I think that uh, in talking about having the budget online, in fact, we're gonna be doing that. I think that's important and hopefully we'll do it in a way that a layman can understand uh, the budget. So um, I think that I certainly agree that unless we can convey to our constituents, to our students, to our faculty, what the board is, is actually uh, thinking and we're asking for suggestions, uh, that's part of the transparency. We listen. And I think that's what's important. One minute question. How would you engage alumni, businesses, and community members to mentor students? And we'll start with Mr. Sullivan. I think that's a great idea. Um, and not only engaging alumni to mentor, but engaging alumni to, uh, to contribute to the, uh, to the foundation, uh, which this year has has done a great job in, in, in uh, increasing its funds to the, um, to the college. So I think alumni is, is, is an area that, that we can tap for that. In terms of mentoring, um, I think there's been great success with uh, immediate past students mentoring uh, current students. Um, mentoring, and I've mentored uh, students myself, and it's, it's a wonderfully rewarding um, thing to do. Uh, but in, at, the, at this level, at the college level, and, and, and even at going down as far as the middle school level, um, I think the, there's greater reaction to uh, someone mentoring who is closer to the age of, of, the, of the person being mentored. So I would, I would focus on past students and see if we can uh, engage a program such as that. Mr. Cedillo. I think that uh, alumni are very important to this institution, uh, not only in fundraising uh, and telling their story to others about how 
successful they've been. They've been in their in their careers and and hopefully to encourage others, motivate others to to uh, come to this college and to give. Mentoring is an also very important. Uh, mentoring in in the trades. Uh, uh, we're we're working uh, with the with the uh, city of Santa Fe and other trade uh, organizations to help to mentor students here at the college. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Well, I'm actually in, uh, a mentor right now with the INSPIRE program, and for the whole time I've been here, every year I've been setting up uh, mentor relationships for my students, and it's part of the reason we have a very good job placement uh, out of our program is because we get students engaged with people in the industry. And so I think I have a, a success rate at that. And I think the college, there's a lot of programs established. And we've been, in the last year, having a internship committee where there's more interaction. So the people who and programs who have been having success with this are engaging more closely with the programs that have not been as successful. And I think we're finding a lot of best practices and we're moving forward a lot with that. Alumni would be great. Uh, frankly, alumni engagement of any sort would be great. I think that was one of the things that we have not done well as an institution over the years. Having gone to school here for 20 years, three years ago I finally got a letter in the mail and there was nothing in it. And so it was like, oh, that's that's not good. But that in, in, in engaging our alumni for a lot of things, not just for money, not just for mentorships, but also for engagement in the legislative process. Uh, this has to be the last question. Welcome, Ms. Siegel. I hope you were successful. <laughs> uh, this is a one-minute question. What role should non-credit classes play at Santa Fe Community College? We'll start with Mr. Wilson. So I think um, one, one area that we should really look at expanding is not just non-credit, but in uh, some of the workforce development and contract training programs, because a lot of corporations, we have the facilities, we have the faculty, and we have uh, a lot of what is necessary for the kind of training programs that a lot of industry doesn't want to do in-house. And I think we've been experimenting, we've been doing some of that, and Black has been leading a lot of the, the way with that. And I think we've had some successes, and we need to continue on that and, and grow and develop that. I also think that because a lot of our funding does come from this community, not from the state, not from tuition, we have to recognize that part of our mission is to serve the community. And so non-credit classes at an affordable rate that can help with continuing education for the entire community has to remain a critical part of what we do. And sometimes that's for credit, but a lot of the times there are great opportunities for non-credit classes. We need to continue our focus on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. S Mr. Sullivan. And non-credit classes are an extremely important uh, aspect of the college. Uh, more than half of the college's students are non-credit students uh, of the some 15,000 total uh, enrollment at the college. Uh, what that means is that we have a lot of people uh, who value lifetime, lifetime learning uh, and are satisfied with the many opportunities that the college provides to give them that. Now, the, the benefit of that also is that many of these are our older residents of the of Santa Fe County and many of these are uh, voters <laughs> and frequent voters and these people also vote for bond issues and they and they uh, are the type of people you want to know what is going on at the college you want them to know and you want them to support your bond issues you will recall that Santa Fe Community College has had a bond issue fail we do not want that to happen again. Mr. Cedillo. Well, as a non-credit student at the Santa Fe Community College, both my wife and I, we uh, that's about six years now. Uh, I think it's extremely important. Not only are we learning, but we interacting with other individuals. Um, and I fully agree with Mr. Sullivan that it's, well, I'm not so sure that I'm that old, but there are other individuals that uh, take this college seriously and do vote 
uh, not only for bond issues, but vote for governing board members. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Siegel. My apologies for being late. Um, it's my busy time of year at the legislature. So non-credit classes are an integral part of what's going on here at the campus, and it brings lots of different people out to the campus and in all of our programs. It's also an opportunity for all those lifelong learners to um, really engage and have some fun trips. I always like to take those uh, those adventure trips where you go to different archaeological sites and hike around. But it, it, it is also an opportunity for us to do some technical training and some business training that individual uh, businesses may want, where we can go in and we can totally tailor a program just for their business. And that can be, it's not necessarily credit, it's not necessarily a certificate, but it can help businesses. So we. Um, we can only continue to grow that part. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll now move to the two-minute closing statements by the candidates in what I hope will be the reverse order from the opening statements. <laughs> so we'll, first we'll hear from Mr. Wilson. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone in the audience. And if we're on TV for this one, thank you to all you folks who are listening back at home. Um, I want to remind everybody that there is early voting up until Friday. And you can vote at room 209 here on the college campus. You can vote down at the county clerk's office in the county building. And you can also uh, uh, vote at the public schools administration building. I hope everyone will get out and vote. If not, regular voting places a week from today and get out there. I think having a big turnout, having a lot of people get out there and, and really show their support by voting in this election is almost as important as who wins. And I want to thank the other candidates and uh, for participating, for being engaged in this. I want to thank Jack. He's, he's shown some initiative and some really good ideas. Um, but I, I will say that I think that the reason I'm running right now is because through my experience here at the community college, I have gotten a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge about assessment, about our accreditation, about the finances about the college, about the morale of the staff, faculty, and students, about what kind of services we're providing, what kind of services we're not providing, what kinds of things this community really wants through my engagement with people in the industry and people in the community that are looking for graduates from our programs. And the reason I'm running is because I think I am the person who is best suited and has the best skill set to be able to help this college grow and expand and develop into the future. I am not running because the st faculty and staff will then have a representative on the board. It is incumbent upon all of the members of the board to represent the faculty, staff, administrators, and students as constituents, as members of the community college district community. It would be my responsibility, just as others, to represent the community at large, and I hope you'll give me the opportunity to do that. Next is Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, attendance this evening. Um, let me say that my vision for the Santa Fe Community College is that the board as the governing body and each individual board member represent not any one specific constituency, but rather all stakeholders, the students, the faculty, the staff, and the community, with a, a transparent and participatory process, which I advocate, also comes the obligation for accountability on everyone's part to best serve the needs of our students and ensure the institution's effectiveness. I've been known for working cooperatively, for fairness, for attention to detail. Uh, I'm honored that former Mayor David Koss has endorsed my candidacy. And David said in his uh, release, I'm happy to endorse Jack Sullivan for the Community College Board. As a city councilor and mayor, I served with Jack for eight years when he was the Santa Fe County Commissioner. We were able to make great strides in water security for Santa Fe in land use planning, and in many other areas. Jack has been a great public servant and would be great for our wonderful community college." End quote. 
I'm also honored that the Santa Fe New Mexican has endorsed my candidacy for this uh, position as well. The important and the critical endorsement, of course, is yours. So uh, with that said, I would ask uh, your consideration and your vote uh, for position four on the Community College Board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Mr. Sedilla. Well, I want to thank the audience and the league and the, the, the University Association of Universities. Association of University Women. With college. I want to thank you as well for sponsoring this forum. I think it's important. The reason I'm running is because in January of last year, when I uh, decided that maybe I could still have something to offer, uh, I'd been associated with the college uh, for a number of years when I was uh, uh, working for Senator Jeff Bingaman. Part of my portfolio was to uh, represent him uh, in, in providing the needs for this college. So I, know, I knew that uh, I could continue to serve uh, the, in this capacity if I was chosen. I was fortunate to have been chosen, appointed, and I have enjoyed uh, the one year that I've been serving on the board. When it came to decide whether I was going to run, I decided, yes, it's time to run and continue uh, with the advocacy to, to represent the college in every aspect. So I, I'm proud that uh, uh, we have a board that has been working very well together. I'm sure that whether Mr. Wilson or whether Mr. Sullivan is, are, are elected, that we will continue to have a board that, that's going to work for this college. So again, uh, as I meet people uh, and I'm campaigning and says, but uh, do you have an opponent? It doesn't matter. What matters are the needs of the college. And what's more important is to raise the consciousness of our community that college boards and school boards are important part of our community. That's really local politics. So thank you. Appreciate your vote. And last, we have Ms. Siegel. <clears throat> Um, thank you. I wanted to call you Madam Chair because that's what I've been doing all day. But uh, thank you, League, for always hosting these forums because it's so important. Um, I'm really glad I don't have an opponent, but it's this last couple of years have been really tough years at the college in some ways and incredibly positive um, in other ways. We've um, dealt with a lot of issues that have been structural issues and long-term issues and the what has happened in the past has really brought a lot of those to the surface for for us to address and i think that the board the the board that we've been working with for the last year has really started to address many of those issues and begun to work closely with not only the president but the faculty senate and the staff senate and and with input from the students. We, this college has so, it is such a great place. And any place can improve. What's brought, been brought to our attention is a reminder, I think, of what a great place it is. And that there are always things to work on. That it's never perfect and everyone never seems to always get along. It, it particularly seems that way in colleges and universities. But we have an opportunity to, to make changes, to change policies, to work together, to continue to bring this college forward. And the last six months have been incredible with more foundation money than ever, um, creating structures that will, in the future, from, from this moment on, protect the college so that things that have happened in the past don't happen. So I am proud to have been a member of the board for the last 18 years and um, would like to serve for the next term. Thank you. Thank you, and that includes tonight's candidate forum. Thank you to all of the candidates for participating, and thank you. Good night.